This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. And with me today, he is my favorite lolly porn connoisseur. It is Hans. Okay, hi. Hey. It's uh, not a very accurate introduction, but thanks. <laughs> Thank you for that, I guess. Fresh off of his brand new podcast, it is Detective Wolfman. Detective Wolfman. Thank you for coming back on the program. How are you doing tonight, even though we've been talking for about like 25 minutes now? I'm doing great, and thanks for having me on again. Absolutely. So soon after an appearance on Babang, a very short episode of Babang, I'll add, but uh, it's always great to have Detective Wolfman on. And today, we're going to be getting into a historic period for filmmaking. Now, a lot of people consider the 1980s to be one of the worst periods. For movies and i think that's completely ludicrous i think that's uh, a, a ridiculous uh, assertion and there are so many great films and it's unfortunate now that what i consider the best film studio warner brothers is going through such a troubled period in their history it is probably worse than their late 90s run where they put out wild wild west and steel and batman and robin I had such high hopes when David Zaslav came into power after the discovery, uh, you know, acquiring Warner Brothers. But it's really been one bad decision after another, and it has lowered the level of class surrounding the Warner Brothers legacy and brand from the moment that they decided to remove the HBO from HBO Max and then flooded the the app with nothing but discovery reality show titles and bad celebrity documentaries. The brand has certainly taken a hit. It has kind of fallen. And Warner Brothers, aside from Barbie, it seems like they can't do anything right lately. And if it wasn't for Barbie, they'd be in the gutter. I mean, even now, there's a lot of conversation going on about the prospect of Warner Brothers and Paramount merging if Paramount, which is another fallen company, isn't acquired by Skydance or Netflix or Universal. So I wanted to go and take a look back at what I think is probably the best run for any film studio ever. A lot of people talk about Miramax in the 90s. They'll talk about... A24, as of when it launched in, what was it, 2011, 2013, 2012, with Charles Swan III up until now. But I think it is unrivaled that Warner Brothers in the 1980s has the best run of any film studio ever. There are so many great movies. And we're going to be getting into some of our favorite films from that era tonight. So... Wolfman, I know you you gave me a preview of your list. Uh, if you want to talk about your introduction here or what your just general sentiment towards Warner Brothers as a company is, whether it's the past, the present, or maybe the future, by all means, sound off. Yeah, well, I'm not as up to date on what they've been putting out in the last few years. And even when I was at my most kind of dialed into movies, uh, I never really paid a lot of attention to the studios, that kind of thing that always just sort of slipped past me. You know, I would recognize the logo before the movie came on, but it's really only recent that I've really started connecting certain studios with certain, uh, certain types of movies um, like new line starting out as a horror company and then kind of getting a little prestige with the Lord of the Rings movies and shit like that. Um, it kind of killed new line. The, I mean, the Lord yeah, of the, kind of. Yeah, after Lord of the Rings, they just kind of evaporated for a period of time. And I know that they've come back kind of recently. The first It movie was a New Line Cinema release. And mm -hmm. after that, it's been pretty touch and go. I think they might have even put out Shazam because Warner Brothers was not like, uh, we feel confident enough to put both the Warner Brothers logo and the DC logo on this. Why don't we just throw this out here via New Line? Yeah. And, you know, I remember I definitely noticed over time, it's like, oh, what happened to TriStar? What happened to Columbia? You know, what happened to all these other little companies that all kind of got absorbed? Um, but when you uh, mentioned uh, doing this, you know, I, a, few, a few movies jumped to mind. 
but when I looked over the list of the entire decade and not just sort of like the big tentpole films that came out, no, you're absolutely right. This is one of the hottest runs in movie history. There are just so many, like, not just box office hits, but complete classics of all genres. Uh, you're getting, like, the best of Tim Burton in this run. You're getting a lot of the best of Michael Keaton in this run. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's... Uh, I was I was just going down the list, and I was like, oh, wow, that? Oh, and that, and that? The best of Corey Feldman. Uh, we got a few, yeah, we got a few good Corey Feldmans in here. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I really don't have to, I don't, I don't have much more to add other than what you just said, but no, it is, it's staggering the number of like good fun movies that are in this lineup. And what about you, Hans? I mean, do you have any affection towards film studios themselves compared to, I guess, just movies in general? No, not at all. I feel like a lot of the movies that I consumed as a, child young teenager was whatever they were playing on three movie channels that we had here uh so i usually caught them either like five minutes in or 10 minutes in or already started or i would have to wait for them to replay the movie four hours from now so that i could catch the beginning so i never really had much of a like an affection to a studio or even really knew what that was like i don't think i was aware of of studios or the way that movies work or like production companies until I went to school uh, to learn about it. So it was never anything that I kept uh, close or, or, you know, made me pay attention to anything more than whatever was on TV. Same with the, with the theater. It was just like, well, whatever since spectacle, that's the type of movie we're going to go see in the cinema. So it was never, you know, let's go see. I mean, Superman three, I guess is a bad example because that was a theater movie, but <laughs> But you know what I mean? Like it was, it was not like a, like a, oh, it's a Warner Brothers movie, so we have to go see it. Uh, but then after we briefly talked about what we should do for January and February, they're um, usually very dry when it comes to good movies. I remember you mentioning doing an episode on '80s Warner Brother movies, and then after yeah, looking at the list of ever released for the whole decade, there there's a lot of. Uh, classics and also a lot of overlooked movies that I don't think many people talk about now but they still I don't want to say hold up because I don't know if they ever held up but in their weirdness um, they just don't make movies or take risks like that anymore so by themselves they're just like a time capsule of what I guess movie studios were spend money on at the time that they don't really dare to do anymore you know, I think just like how there is the auteur theory, there's something to there being a house formula to like a, it just a, a certain type of recipe that these studios are able to produce their films with. And Warner Brothers movies, especially Warner Brothers blockbusters that are produced by Warner Brothers, not just distributed by them, have a particular kind of flow to them where you can look at a movie like Barbie, you can look at a movie like The Flash, you can look at a, a big spectacle that flopped, like, I don't know, Batman and Robin, and or the Goonies from the 1980s. And there's a certain kind of vibe and trajectory and the music will sound a certain way. And there's always this big, bad creature villain thing. It, it, it has a particular series of punches and beats to it. Like, there's a similar group of people that are giving notes on how to do this or how to tweak this. And people have made that comment about A24, in A24, I think like 95% of their output is acquired and not produced in-house. But that, I think, applies to them as well because that movie that they're acquiring is not really ever in its final state when they take it. You know, there's going to be tune-ups that are done. They're going to offer notes. There's going to be tweaks and things that are made to kind of fit it within this mold that they do put out as an A24 release. So I think... That certainly applies. Uh, 20th Century Fox during the 1960s has another particular kind of vibe to it, although I don't think there's really any good movies that, that came out in the 1960s. I think Midnight Cowboy, uh, 2001, that might be it. Off the top of my head, off the dome. I don't, I don't know. 1960s is probably the worst era for movies. Uh, 1980s, full of blockbusters. We 
took quite a departure from the nihilist independent spirit era of the 1970s where every movie ended with a protagonist being shot in the face or dying of AIDS before they knew what AIDS was or just something bad happening to the lead characters. On the other hand, you know, you're, you know, right in the middle of Ronald Reagan McDonald's 1980s America. And these are all in one way or another feel good movies, interesting movies, dynamic movies where typically things will turn out decent enough for the characters that you're following. And you're going to walk away feeling good. And you're probably going to rewatch that movie 15 times after the fact. Um, so why don't we kick things off? We, we have each assembled lists to d discuss certain movies that were released by Warner Brothers throughout this era. I have quite a few, just in case there are some overlapping. Hans, I know you've got some. And then Wolfman, you showed me quite a few. So w why don't you start things off, Wolfman, with one of your films from this era? All right, well, I'll just go in chronological order. Um, and yeah, this is uh, probably a pretty obvious pick, but my first pick is Wolfen. 1981's Wolfen. Albert Finney, Edward James Olmos, uh, Gregory Hines. Um, have you guys seen Wolfen? I have actually never seen Wolfen. I'm not even familiar with that. I, I don't have a mental image of the poster at all. But Gregory Hines and Albert Finney, that's, a, that's an interesting combination. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Hans? I'm familiar with the image. I remember seeing it. Hold on. Let me. This image. Uh, when I will go to the video store, that was one of the covers that was very. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is familiar. Yeah. To me. The, the font is familiar so, to me, too. So uh, those of you who are listening to this should go sign up at patreon.com slash Loras and join the $5 tier just so you can see the posters that Hans likes to share with us yeah. in the middle of the show. That's uh, how me and my friends used to pick movies back in the day at the video store, which is whatever cover looks cool or scary. And it was usually very disappointing. <laughs> I'm not familiar with Wolfen. I'm familiar with that cover just because I remember very vividly the, I guess, wolf illustration they have there. But uh, yeah, they used to be a very, I don't even want to say hit and miss. It was usually miss whenever... <laughs> We'll go to the video store and just base whatever movie we're renting with the cover because there's a lot of really bad horror movies where the cover makes it look a lot cooler than what the movie is. I don't know if that's the case here, but uh, but it's not a great way of picking the movie that you, you want to rent for the weekend. I mean, I think it makes it exciting. It's kind of like going to the casino and playing the slots. Maybe, maybe you'll hit, probably not. I certainly fell victim to a movie called Without Warning, which was a UFO film that starred Jack Palance and Martin Landau. And I thought the, the art of that looked so cool. And then they show you the alien and it was literally a Halloween mask. It fucking sucked. I just saw that Whitley Stryber was the author of the book that this movie Wolfen is based on. Yeah, here Hans is pulling up the Without Warning post. Here God, it is. Cool no, poster. that's a right different there. one. <laughs> <laughs> that oh, is a different okay. without warning. <laughs> okay, this one. It's a very no, scary. No, <laughs> no. Jane Charismeric. Okay. Wow. Whatever happened to her? <laughs> no, that's not it. Oh, that's not I think this is the same okay. movie, but it, it different title. No, that one. No. Okay. Well. So yeah, but Whitley uh, Strieber or Striver wrote the book Wolf and. He did Communion. That was another disappointing UFO movie that people have always talked up. And I know he did. I think he might have collaborated with Art Bell at a certain point. And okay. he also wrote The Hunger, which I think is a Warner Brothers movie, too. The um, the David Bowie vampire movie? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, Wolfen is a movie that I first saw when I was a kid. It was on TV. And uh, I, I don't know if I want to get into spoilers or not, since you guys haven't nah, seen it. No, go ahead. Have at it. Okay. Well, as a kid, I didn't like the movie because it's not a werewolf movie. Um, not technically. Uh, when you find out what's going on, it's something different. Uh, and that really pissed me off. Um, but I watched it again several years ago as an adult, and I dug the hell out of it. Uh, it's got a great score by James Horner. It's directed by this guy named Michael uh, Wadley, I guess is how you pronounce his name. But 
This is one of those instances where they get a guy who's pretty much only directed music videos and concerts and they give him a feature film and he knocks it out of the fucking park. Uh, just like uh, Russell Mulcahy and the Highlander, uh, the, the music video director to movie director, often it goes horribly wrong, but when it works, it works so well. Uh, the movie has such a vibe. It's so atmospheric. It's so cool and haunting. And I know I use a lot of these words a lot when I describe movies. I have a limited vocabulary, whatever. Um, but it's yeah, it is a fascinating movie. It is a it's a police procedural slash horror film, which I know is probably overdone. But that is a genre that I love. I love the mixture of crime and horror when it's done well it's just like two of my favorite things and when they blend well in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing i think they go to bed go together better than fucking chocolate and peanut butter um but basically the plot is you have these people in new york city they're turning up dead they're mauled by an animal uh it, you know they assume oh i guess i guess it's a wolf or a big dog it's got to be a big dog we don't have wolves in new york city Albert Finney is the lead detective who's trying to solve these murders. It kind of leads him to this uh, like group of Native Americans who work this construction site. I think they're like I think they're working on the Twin Towers at the time. But uh, Edward James Olmos, not an Indian, um, but he plays a young uh, Indian man uh, who's kind of involved. And basically, it's these these men who uh, are the descendants of the Wolfen, this ancient Native American spirit. And they take the shape of wolves and they, uh, for the longest time, they would just go after like homeless people and vagrants, like people who were dying because they could sniff that they were cancerous or cirrhotic or whatever. But now they're, I think they're going after like these developers um, who are like fucking with Native American land. Uh, but it's just a cool movie. Uh, the wolves are like very terrifying. There are great shots. This is pre-Predator where you're seeing like infrared vision through the wolf's eye as it's hunting people through New York city. Uh, very cool, very scary. And just the, the, the brazenness of having your villains be these obstreperous engines and your hero be the most Anglo man on planet earth, Albert Finney, uh, with Gregory Hines as sort of a comedic sidekick character. Um, you would never get that again today. Uh, but well, it's maybe if S. Craig Zoller decides to do a remake of Wolfen, a new yeah. adaptation of Wolfen. But uh, it's it's super cool. There's a scene in particular where he follows Edward James Olmos to like the docks to the harbor, and Edward James Olmos is like out on the sand, and he starts taking off his clothes, and you think he's gonna turn into a werewolf right there, and he doesn't he starts going through like a psychological metamorphosis and so it's just edward james almost nude behaving like a wolf which is far more terrifying than a werewolf yeah and especially if you look into his real life crimes oh oh well i had no idea so oh you're gonna well to, you're gonna have to hit us with those well he might be a, just... a fan of the lolly porn himself oh, no. might be another a hispanic man <laughs> well, no. i don't know no, nah, he uh, he's got a bad, bad thing from the early '90s with a 12 year old. Oh and, no, Edward! And I guess whoever was running Sci Fi Channel and did Battlestar Galactica just did not give a shit. They were just like, huh? What? Yeah. We don't care about that. So I mean, are they really Dexter too? Oh yeah, yeah he, he was. was on, yeah, he was on yeah. Dexter. Yeah, he's I mean, one of these guys who Miami Vice. That was that was before. That was before. Yes. He was he was okay. still innocent. Yeah. during that time but he i think just, it was, he's probably one of one of those guys that's like i mean look at him you know which is all the more horrifying imagine being that 12 year old <laughs> yeah. it's not yeah, fucking it's worse, but it's smiling chevy chase it's a pockmarked edward james almost of wolfen yeah it's not james franco is the creepy dad from that dexter season i don't remember it's what stand that. and right, deliver so, so he was I'm, a ghost no on that i'm noticing a theme here where I feel like, I think like the last three or four times I've come on here, I've learned about yet another uh, Hollywood figure who has a background in child rape. Uh, is I, it's I an just, educational are, show, Wolfman? Are they are they really just all in on it? 
that's, I that's think really, we just talk about it. That's really what it's starting to look movies. like. Yeah. We talk about old movies, right? And I feel like Hollywood used to be a little crazier back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Where a lot of things would just be overlooked. And just a little, oh, what are laws? You know, yeah. I'm on the TVs. I mean, the Albert cinema. Einstein was fucking his cousin. People were just sickos back in the day. Yeah, they're just autistic, you know. It's fine. It was just that behavior. It was so all all Hollywood behavior by stars used to be seen as just like, well, what do you expect them to do? You know, <laughs> it's like, well, maybe not that fucking awful thing. I, but you I, know, yeah. I, I would digress. expect them. I would expect them to fuck hot famous people. I feel like that's like the the you coolest think. part of being a famous person is you. You get to bang hot celebrities, but apparently, yeah. no, they all get in the club and they want to fuck kids. Well, just wait till we get to the Lost Boys. What a waste. <laughs> oh, boy. Fuck. Uh, anyway, sorry to interrupt you, Wolfman. No, no that's fine. You're, you're um, selling me on checking out Wolfen, though. That is one that was completely below the radar for me, so... Yeah, check it out. The, uh, the third act and, like, the climax of the film is especially, like, dreamlike um and just very just very interesting um and because it's because it's early 80s it still has like a very kind of gritty 70s new york feel to it and it kind of the way that it's shot you're kind of seeing a transition between that like 70s kind of documentarian style of filming into the more stylized kind of 80s urban visuals that you would get in like uh like michael mann type movies or in like a movie like the highlander um yeah it's just uh it's a very cool flick and yeah i think uh in in horror circles i guess it's bigger but i think for the average the average moviegoer it's still a little slept on so people should check it out excellent uh well i will also say for 1981 another great film from Warner Brothers released during that time is Body Heat, which I think is the perfect. What you're not a fan, Hans? No, I just remember how I told you to st stub my toe earlier today. I just touched it, and it fucking hurts really bad. So I'm just over here in pain. Okay, you pain looked very yeah. I thought you were just like ah no, Body Heat. I don't like that movie. That movie sucks. No, uh, Body Heat is a great example of a modern noir, and it's a little predictable. Maybe we've talked about it before. I think it's one of the great erotic thrillers to come out of the late 20th century. It kind of kicked things off before we got into the whole basic instinct, fatal attraction era that uh, would occupy the late 80s and early 90s. Stars William Hurt and Kathleen Turner. And uh, William Hurt is quite an unattractive man for modern standards. But back in the day, what a stud. You could be balding, you know, you could have a very boring face. Doesn't matter. Kathleen Turner, uh, her voice. What do you what do you make of her voice? Well, yeah, in the in the spirit of uh anime porn, I loved it when she was Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Yeah. Oh fuck. I was gonna say it's very turn the page music video from Metallica from the nineties. I don't know if you guys remember that video where it was just prostitutes being sad. That's kind of what it is. Reminds me. I don't remember that. I never watched a Metallica music video aside from Enter Sandman, I think. Well, someone got it out there. <laughs> Go search for the Turn the Page video. Our it's audience just collectively thought, focus. wow, Hans is old. Yeah, it's an old, yeah. yeah. Well, no, I'm, remember I'm that Rod remember what... Stewart music video where the prostitute is set? Yeah, that's what they basically heard right now. What what yeah. album is that off of, Hans? Because I'm not, I'm not remembering, remembering that song. Uh, might be load. Hmm. Uh, I, I feel like I a, definitely oh no, it's it. when they did when they did the garage ink that was uh remakes, right? That's a Bob Seeger song. Turn the page. Oh, okay. But you know how in the nineties they re they cut their hair and they released. I think it was called Garage Ink, where yeah, they would just remake album. all the songs. Yeah. So that one. That's okay. that's. I mean, that's when I was a child. <laughs> so that's the music video. I remember just being like, oh. Are they going to show titties on that sad prostitute? Oh, they didn't. All right. Well, I guess she's just sad. There's nothing here for this 12-year-old boy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not paying for that. Yeah. Frankly. Sad prostitute. 
have either of you guys <laughs> seen Body Heat? I haven't, which is kind of a that's crazy. A, a, a it would dare, be a dereliction of duty for a, a guy like me. Yeah, it's right up your alley, Wolfman. You got to get on that. So Body Heat has a great cast, and I think the real uh, standout here is probably Ted Danson. Ted Danson plays this very off-type character in the movie. Uh, he's also abnormally tan and Jewish seeming. He looks like Alex Rocco in The Godfather. Uh, he's great. And, you know, it's the the classic, oh, you know, he's the attorney who's kind of being set up by this femme fatale, very bog standard storyline. But because it's helmed by Lawrence Kasdan, I believe this was his first movie. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a, a terrific piece of filmmaking. It also has Mickey Rourke in it as well. And he's employed to do a couple of explosions. And then we watch how this woman basically takes William Hurt's character's life and unravels it because he is so enamored with her and he can't help himself. So uh, Body Heat is one of my first selections here. I think it's a terrific movie and uh, maybe the best example of an early 80s erotic thriller that one can check out. Yeah, one of the reasons why I haven't seen it, well, two, one, because I, I like almost everyone involved with it. Um, one, I always heard it was just like a remake of Double Indemnity. Yeah, it is. Um, it, it, yeah, it, okay. it is. And so that, that always kind of kept me distant. But also, because it is an erotic thriller and because it stars Kathleen Turner, that is, that, that's a bit of a leap for me. Well, she's not, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, not gonna, I'm not, I'm not saying she's unattractive, but she's, it's, she's, you know, she's, well, she became she's a not, burly girl pretty quick, not, you know, but yeah, in this movie, team. she's still put together well enough, you know, she's not, uh, porky or anything like that, not to be too mean about an aging woman, but she's, you can believe it more. Let me say that it's 1981. What you're saying is that he Bruce Bruce Willis deserved better at moon on moonlighting. Is that what you're saying? That was Civil Shepherd. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> Same person to me. I don't know. No, Civil <laughs> Shepherd was hot when she was young. Okay, well. Wrong white woman. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> and also it's William Hurt, you know? So it's not like he's this super attractive hunk of a guy. Even by 1981, like like I was saying before, yeah, you could be handsome and you could be a leading man with a receding hairline, excuse me. Uh -huh. But it's not unbelievable that he would be fucking uh Kathleen Turner. No, but I do think I do think that at at least at the time I do think William Hurt was a more attractive man to women than Kathleen Turner was an attractive woman to men. Hmm. But I could be wrong. I was not adult in 1981. I was not an adult in 1981. I mean, Kathleen Turner must have had a reputation for being sexy if she was also later cast as Jessica Rabbit. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, it's it's yeah. not a I don't it's not a fluke. You know, yeah, it, I, I, I remember that was like her. I remember there being jokes like when she would be when she would guest star on like TV shows and shit later in her career. That was always the joke of like her being like an ex sex pot or whatever. Oh, yeah. Or, like, dude, a, wasn't she cast as a trans man on Friends? Wasn't she like yeah. Ross's trans dad? Yeah, I want to I want to apologize to uh, Civil Shepherd. Civil Shepherd because uh, Kathleen Turner, I forgot how Vincent D'Onofrio she used to look oh, like. Back in the 80s. So now I'm like, oh, fuck, yeah. That's it's a very handsome yeah, woman. That's, mm. that's very far from what I remember. So I'd like to apologize. Uh, my memory failed me horrendously. <laughs> well, it reminds me of uh, Hilary Swank in the Black Dahlia movie where she's cast as oh, like the hypersexual wow. femme fatale and it just doesn't work. Um, she's a fine yeah. actress and like, I'm sure she's a lovely person, but like that is not the role for her. No, that sounds very gross. Like when your cat is in heat and you just don't want to see it that way, you know, it's uh, a <laughs> very, very unfortunate. I've never seen Black Dahlia. That's the one Brian De Palma movie that's probably of note that I haven't watched yet. Um, it is. I mean, it's not it's not great. Um, it's very flawed. It's not a good adaptation of the book. 
but I also feel I feel like it is unjustly maligned. I feel like there's more there's more good to say about it than people give it credit for. But I also feel that way because I saw it before I ever read a word of Elroy. Oh, so okay. A lot of people who read the book are familiar with his work before they saw the movie. Yeah, there's no way on earth they're gonna enjoy it. Why were we talking about Tony Scott? Uh, cause the, the hunger. The all oh, right. The one that I picked uh was from 1980, uh, Alter States, which I think we. Didn't we see that in, in Boston in one of our trips? Or no, that was, that was Civic TV, and that's not Tony Scott. That's Ken oh, Russell. Right. William Hurts in that no, one. No, no, no. Yeah, I, yeah. So I was going to say, uh, I pulled up the list of, of Warner Brothers movies because I before I talk shit without knowing, which I do a lot, but I wanted to make sure that they don't do any type of like risky movie like this anymore. I'm not sure what Alter State's budget was in 1980 i'm assuming it wasn't huge but uh what they were able to do visually and performance wise with that movie i think uh i wish that big studios were brave enough to take risks as much as they used to back in the 80s because something like this done with modern technology i don't know how much better it would be because part of what works is that some of the effects look kind of dated and a little not the smoothest, not the nicest to look at, uh, but it adds a lot of personality to what you're supposed to be seeing. Uh, I just kind of wish that, you know, studios were brave enough to take risks like this anymore because, sure, there there's going to be, I don't know, uh, four out of five that are going to be shit, but then you find little gems like this one where there's uh, something that just works so well uh, that... Uh, I don't think I don't think it's been remade, right? Alter states. Um, but it, it works so well as like a capsule of what 80s sci-fi used to be like. And it's also very creepy and and William Hurt and his shitty hairline uh, give a very solid uh, uh um performance, acting like this guy that starts to go a little a little nuts, a little crazy into this this world, this psychedelic world, I guess. Uh uh, that uh yeah i just that's one of the things that i that i started noticing when when trying to come up with a list for 80s movies that it's such a sad state of movies now where it's probably the easiest time in movie history to make anything because of the tools that you're given but it's also probably the most creatively bankrupt uh era of movies too and i don't know if it has to do with that same thing that now anyone can you know make a movie with uh with a phone and have it be really good quality if you know how to how to light it it's going to look professional but at the same time i feel like a lot of the ingenuity and a lot of the the things that creative people were able to do with lesser means has been completely lost and now to the point where studios don't even take those risks anymore. And that sucks. Uh Lores, I think you're, you're muted. muted Lores. Yeah. Or yeah, there you are. Hi, there you back. Are. Yeah. Yeah. We're good. Sorry about that. Microphone troubles. Uh I was gonna ask mm -hmm. that question exactly. If you think that that is the cause of that, that the creative bankruptcy comes from a wide availability of these professional tools to be able to increase the quality of whatever it is you're making or is it that the sample size to go off of has expanded as a result of that and so you're seeing more dreck coming about from that and it's affecting the overall view of what that is well you used to work a lot harder to make your movie right um so maybe there's just an oversaturation of a lot of garbage from people that shouldn't be able to put stuff out, mm -hmm. but it's more difficult to find little gems. Like I'm, I'm not calling alter state a little gem, but you know what I mean? Like they would come from independent artists. They're not going to come from a studio that's somehow funding this. Uh, there is some distributors that I think take risks uh, with some interesting movies, but a lot of, what they've gotten comes from that from from ha being 
usually like a Hollywood successful person, usually an actor or someone that's kind of connected that ends up putting um, interesting independent movies out or distributing them, uh, which is why we get things like, I don't know, the Greasy Strangler is the first one that comes to mind. I, I don't know if that one qualifies, but weird ass movies like that where it's just like, I don't know why this is being produced. It's funny. It It works in its own like little niche thing um but something like altered states like can you imagine something this crazy being released by anyone that's not like a i don't even think david lynch has enough of a pull to pull something weird like that anymore no i think uh twin peaks the return was probably the closest thing you'll ever get to that because that was cbs and paramount showtime deciding to play on on you know his terms which originally that deal fell through he wanted to do one thing they said nah we're not doing that and so they were going to go ahead without him and it was going to be twin peaks season three with i guess uh a different a bunch of different directors and it was, maybe would have been loosely based off whatever idea he had in place which that would have been terrible a terrible path to go down and then they eventually maybe about a year later re reworked the terms and then that came together as a success so yeah no i i mean i i don't know that ties back to what we were talking about earlier not on this program but about the ai boom that's about to happen with sora where now you're gonna have photorealistic image it's not just animation like anyone's gonna be able to do a pixar looking movie if they want but you can do photorealistic visuals there where you can see people playing with their cat or something and then you'll take a look at the cat and the cat has two paws coming out of his leg instead of one and you're like huh that's weird or the pillow starts to disintegrate into the bed itself and it's like this dream world logic of flaws that are popping up it's kind of crazy but i'm, I'm very excited about all of that yeah we're gonna do an episode on uh what is a new show called on Saturday that we're doing or Sunday that we're doing? Uh, our British friends. We're doing Jake and Andy. Angie's live stream on Sunday, I believe. And that'll be around like five o'clock. So check that out if you're on patreon.com slash low risk because you're getting this episode in time. But if you're and not, then it's... check it out on YouTube. It's probably uploaded, certainly uploaded by now. It's all about this, right? About like AI and like the uses of it and how most people pretend to hate it but yeah we're gonna talk about that and a couple of movies like salt burn which you haven't watched yet you get you gotta get around to that did you start euphoria no <laughs> okay you gotta get around to that too just cram it in a day all right uh why don't we move on to the next selection from detective wolfman all right well my next pick is another film from 1981 and that is Burt Reynolds' Sharky's Machine. Uh, Very good selection. Very underrated movie overall. And Burt Reynolds as a director is kind of slept on. I've, I've seen all three of his movies. Sharky's Machine is definitely the best that he's directed. But um, what did he do? He did Gator and he did... It was oh, White man. Lightning? He, he, did, he, he did a comedy with Dom DeLuise where they were both dying. Okay. And it was actually pretty funny. It was pretty solid. It was the second movie he directed. It was between Sharky's Machine and Gator. Maybe he directed more than three movies, but I know that those were the first three films and they were all theatrically released, I believe, by Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. Well, a little inside baseball, my very first podcast appearance ever was on Drunk on Movies as a guest to talk Sharky's Machine. And there you the, go history the the internet has never recovered um but this is a movie that i watched on a whim i guess maybe back in 2022 or 2021 just for the first time i was looking on prime looking for something to watch and i guess it just had a good thumbnail and a decent little description and i was like oh that sounds kind of cool burt reynolds i'll throw that on and i i just loved it um the best thing the best thing I can say for this movie is it has everything you want in a movie. It's got action, mystery, romance, comedy. It's got a hot babe. It's got great like gunshot effects. Um, it's just a cool 
crime movie about um, this uh, high class call girl who witnesses a murder and these cops are you know, like keeping an eye on her and they're like staking her out. Burt Reynolds falls in love with her. Uh, you've got Henry Silva with his fucking Dick Tracy face as this crazy maniac killer. The antagonist. Um, I, I just saw him in the Manchurian Candidate recently where he played a Korean communist who <laughs> led the Americans astray. Yes, that's back, back when you would just cast a white dude with a weird face as a Korean. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get back to that. That's yeah. how we return to tradition. No, I want I want Refn to do that with the Crying Freeman movie, but I, you know that's that's my that's my dream that will never come true. Uh, but yeah, uh, Sharky's Machine, yeah, directed by Burt Reynolds, starring Burt Reynolds. It's it's just so much fun. It's so cool. There's great stunts, and it's like a mid budget movie. You know, there's not like crazy explosions. Um, I think it's shot in Atlanta. Uh, but yeah, goddamn, it's just such a fun time. And I'd never even heard of it before I saw it on prime, which I thought was just total bullshit. Uh, all the supporting characters are interesting and great performances by great character actors. You got Charles Durning in there. Um, no, it's, it's just a blast. Uh, I think and- it also kicks off the trend is this is especially a trend with Warner brothers movies, but the trend of how do you end the movie? The antagonist falls from a building. Yeah. The end. <laughs> yeah. And this one, I think, has the record for the largest fall by a stuntman. Okay. So it, it, it might have that going for it. Maybe I'm talking out of my ass right now. Maybe that record's been beat. Who knows? But it is a very impressive fall. I'll say that. It's probably the best one because you check out Batman. You check out, oh, God, what's the, what is it? Lethal, not Lethal Weapon. Um, Fuck, there's a... No, 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 no. I mean, yeah, it happens in Die Hard, too. But there's a romantic thriller from the early 90s with Richard Gere, Kim Basinger, and Eric Roberts where the bat... Like, they literally repeat the ending of Batman for that movie. Oh, wow. Yeah, almost... Like, I think they might have used the same cathedral and everything, too. Um, It's like Final Analysis or Deadly Analysis, something like that. Um, But, yeah, I I, I had had more to say about it... uh... Back then, I haven't watched it in a little while. I didn't have time to check it out again before we recorded. But I've got it. I think, uh, yeah, one one just testament to how good it was. I watched it once on Amazon Prime, and I immediately ordered the Blu-ray. Uh, like, I, I didn't wait. I was like, I have to I, have this. I think you've mentioned that movie before, or someone else has, because I'm not very familiar with Burt Reynolds' directing career. Mm. But this movie sounds very familiar. I think... Either you have mentioned it before, or maybe Loris and I got into his directing career at some point because that movie sounds very familiar. I just have never seen it. I feel like we might have done an episode on one of his films because I got in 2020 or 2021 when lockdowns were still happening. I got into like a big Burt Reynolds rabbit hole that I think was kicked off by watching Deliverance for the first time, and so I was like, I want to see. We were supposed to, but we never did. An episode on Deliverance. No, no, no. We, we on Burt Reynolds. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I feel like maybe we we're supposed to do that with Jacob A. Miller for an episode. I don't know. Sharky's Machine. I don't know. That title looks sounds very familiar. And what um, Wolfman said too. Uh, the movie you were talking about was it's called The End with Dom De Luis. Thank you. Yeah, it's the end. Comedy. Yeah, Burt Reynolds finds out he's dying of cancer. And spoiler alert, he oh, doesn't it's... die at the end. So. Also, I wonder if any of this was released because it just looks like he was just giving a class at F- FSU, Florida Oof. State University. Oh, this no. is the last thing he has on his IMDb. <laughs> that looks so bad. Yeah, just, this is not a movie. This is him teaching. Yeah. yeah. He's so interesting, Burt Reynolds, because you have an idea of him as like, kind of like a macho airhead, but he's a very talented director. And he knows a lot about filmmaking and it makes the way that he's framed by the time he's doing Boogie Nights in the late 90s and how he was like completely repellent to what that film was and didn't understand it. It kind of makes him look dumb because that movie turns out to be a massive hit. People love that movie. 
it, I think it gives him a little bit more credit if you understand what his history is besides leading man and eventual, unfortunately, like sitcom star on CBS shows in the early 90s, you know? So uh, Burt Reynolds is a terrific actor, great director. Who the fuck this is kid, this? This kid looks like Donald Trump Jr. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's his son, oh, Quentin. That's unfortunate. Oh, uh, you can't, you can't name your son Quentin. <laughs> no, Qu- a name like Quentin that comes with a physiognomy. Quentin no offense to any Reynolds. Quentins out there listening right now. <clears throat> that's unfortunate. But no, but like Burt Burt Reynolds, yeah, he he kind of has that. He got that reputation, yeah, for being kind of schlocky and yeah, kind of just like an action like macho guy when yeah he made a lot of those movies but a lot of that was because he had like you know he had this cachet with his name and his career and he would help out all of his like friends in the business who were struggling and they would get saddled with some shitty kind of drive-in movie and he would be in the movie to make sure it made money to like help help his pals out um and that cost him a lot in his career to kind of like stand up for those dudes and uh, I mean, you know, who who knows? He could have like like everybody else that we talk about on this show. Maybe he fucked a kid. I hope not. But uh, I don't think so. what, what <laughs> I heard about every, Burt everything Reynolds, I heard about him, he sounds like a stand up guy. Yeah, no, I had never heard anything like that about Burt Reynolds. What I heard about Burt Reynolds was he was the one getting fucked. So, but th- oh. there was a, there was allegedly, you know, there was always this talk like Jesus. after Burt Reynolds dies, he is going to release this autobiography. And it's going to detail how many dicks he sucked and how he got fucked up the ass by all these executives, but he wanted to protect his leading man image, but he wants to also write about what actually happened. And that never happened. That never came out. There was no book. Nothing ever said that. They're doing it about P. Diddy now. Well, he did all of that. All the, yes, all these black musicians you thought were gay, P. Diddy, Usher. Usher is apparently married now. P. Diddy, he's a rapist, allegedly. Yeah. Anyway, let's get off the sex crimes, huh? We'll do 1988's yeah. Daffy Duck's Quack Busters. Daffy Duck, he gets called the N-word in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. How about that? I'm going to have to go back and watch it because I never, I never picked up on that, but I, I saw that going around. Oh, yeah. We, we picked up on that. You know, I, I was watching Roger Rabbit, and Donald Duck does call him the N-word. The subtitles on Disney Plus and what the animators say, they're fucking liars. They are full of shit. What their excuses what doesn't even make sense. Look it up right now, Hello? please. Please look Boy, this up. Buddy. What, let's watch the clip. We've probably done this before. We've probably done this five Wait. times before. XBO Max, is it? No, 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 no. Just YouTube. Just go to YouTube and find Who Framed Roger Rabbit N-Word. So this is what happens. Daffy Duck is racially abused by Donald Duck here. And that is not a Warner Brothers movie. That movie is so impressive that they were able to get half of these Warner Brothers ca- characters together with the Disney characters, and nobody seemed to give a shit. That would never happen today. That was uh, Touchstone. Yes, yeah. That's another one of those. Another one of those movie companies that went went away. They folded. Mm-hmm. Great logo. So Daffy Ducks, Daffy Ducks, Quackbusters. As Hans looks up this clip and will surely interrupt whatever I'm saying here. Um, Daffy Ducks, Quackbusters was one of these Looney Tunes movies that were released in the 1980s that were an assembly of different Looney Tunes shorts. They would typically take existing ones. They would build a framework in which these shorts are now connected to one another with new animation, new voice acting, and then release it in theaters as a movie. So Hans is smiling, which means he's probably found something. I mean, kind of, right? What is he saying then? (laughs) <laughs> he's in competition with daffy duck right now they're they're doing competing piano playing what is he oh, saying I can't, I can't put the subtitles on come on <laughs> yeah it, i don't know i mean it does sound like the word but i don't know he's saying it he's absolutely and they're they're what they said he's actually saying makes no sense at all the animators love to sneak shit in like that all the time. They they hit a penis in the Aladdin art. Oh, 
Uh, for those who couldn't see, they they referenced a Donald Duck reading Mein Kampf uh, illustration. Okay, if you're if you're listening, anyone out there, and you're <laughs> any anyone oh, anyone who's big on Twitter, we gotta get uh, Donald Duck to be the next uh, based figure, the next based meme on Twitter. Yeah. Like I need uh, va- vaporwave supercut vids of base Donald Duck. The face of the alt right is white Donald Duck mm-hmm. calling Daffy Duck the N word because he couldn't play piano properly. Is that I I I I haven't seen that movie in a long time. Was that a uh, Warner Brothers in the nineties? That was not. No, that was Touchstone, Touchstone, which we were talking about. But it had ha- like half the cast was Warner Brothers animation, so. Uh, there's there's that Snopes, which was always reliable, says yeah. false. He's not saying the N word, and I, I'm only looking at this so I can see what their reasoning was, like what they yeah. claimed he was saying, so we could have an exact quote. But did anyway, just to not get too derailed by that, um, had you guys ever seen any of those Looney Tune movies that would assemble? the different shorts and then put it out as a feature film. Cause this is just one of many. There was the Bugs Bunny road runner movie. There was, I think a 1001 rabbit tales. Uh, I, I forget what the actual thing there was. I think there was a fantasy Island parody as well. Oh, yeah. So Coffee, yeah. yeah. No, I don't think I ever saw any of these. Oh, they, they released them on VHS, I believe, or they went to theaters and then they, they dropped on VHS shortly after. So here's what they're claiming that Donald says, God, Dern, stubborn nitwit. Mm-hmm. He is not yeah, saying nitwit. A... No, he no. is not. And there's nothing to imply <laughs> a sense of stubbornness in the clip that would make sense of that. So, no, the animators knew exactly what they were doing. And whoever wrote the script put that in there and they don't want the blowback. Yeah, you know when when uh, Donald Duck speaks, wit and er don't really sound <laughs> similar. I don't know where. Well, yeah, you would get. Has anyone uh, tracked down who did the voice? Because they said the line, they would know. Yeah, was it, it probably? I mean, Mel Blanc was definitely dead by that point, right? Yeah, I'm sure they had. The, I'm sure they had a, the next guy, like they did with Bugs Bunny and all. all you know, all, all the other big characters. Let's check it out on the IMDb real quick. Uh, but anyway, Hans, you were talking about the Fantasy Island. No, I wasn't. <laughs> You're the one that ended up pulling this animated movie. That nobody well, here's how this podcast about. works is if I'm looking up something, you do the talking. If you're looking up something, oh, I yeah. do the talking. Yeah. So Fantasy Island had a little little midget man that was from the Philippines that ended up killing himself. Uh, and there's a very funny 911 call. Where, uh, this is like, your next what, what? Warner Brothers '80s classic. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, I just remember the 911. The Herb call. Villa Chase snuff film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Were they like, "What happened?" And he's like, "Oh, I sure myself." And they're like, "Are you are you in pain?" And he's like, "Because he's a little mm-hmm. Filipino, <laughs> Filipino fucking uh, watermelon head uh, uh, midget." Now, technically, Warner Brothers did produce a snuff film in the 1980s. They did the Twilight Zone movie, directed by right. John Landis. Who so. killed also a Filipino boy. No, where, where were they from? They were, two, they were two Vietnamese. One was Vietnamese and one was Chinese, I believe. And they were playing Vietnamese kids. I'm going to go out on a limb. And I would not only not be surprised to find out that John Landis fucked the kid, uh... I would not be surprised that he fucked his own kid. Uh, well, gonna... Max Max Landis does have BPD, as yeah. in borderline personality disorder, and you only get that one way: being raped. That's right. You're being. Now, I'm not. I'm not accusing because I don't want to get into legal trouble. But mm-hmm. I would not be shocked. I mean, I think the doctors would have had to say, "Yeah, that's that's what happened," in order for that to be the case. Also. For the record, who framed Roger Rabbit? The voice of Donald Duck was the, I believe, the forever voice of Donald Duck. It was Clarence Nash. Now, would you have a hard time believing this guy said the N word? No, no, I wouldn't. Yeah. Okay. So, th- I mean, I think this is this is cut and dry a case of 
uh, racism. One of the movies that I watched this last couple of days, uh, Warner Brothers movies from the 80s that I have not seen before, was After Hours. And that movie was great. Uh, it was so much fun. Is that Scorsese directing it? It's, it's a big director, yeah. right? Um, <clears throat> I And, and uh, it brought me back to the, the thing of like, what are they giving money to? And back in, I think this is 80... 87 86 uh and what Bar warner brothers is moving, making with their money now because this is this is pretty much a movie that it all happens in one night and it's all about a guy that's kind of trying to get some p-u-s-s-y uh and then he just fails throughout the whole movie when he you know tries to get some p-s p-u-s-s-y from one girl and then it's like well no there's this other one so let me see if I can get some from this other one. And then he can't or he doesn't. And it's just a, a whole movie about a, a kind of dorky guy that tries to sound cooler than he actually is to get some puss uh, and fails. And I just thought that it was very interesting that. Um, and I guess I go back to the same taking risks, right? Because there's not really a, I mean, a lot happens in the movie, but if you think about it in like a, character study type of thing or like a what actually happens in this uh one night movie i mean it's just a guy that tries to get some pussy and doesn't get any by the end of the day and then he's left outside of his house uh wondering if it was worth going through all the trouble that he went through the night before and that's it and then the movie ends and you're just like okay um i'm perfectly fine I'm actually a fan of movies like this where it's just like it's very weird and a lot of things that are are not supposed to happen happen and where the main character is not the most likable, handsome, you know, chiseled big guy that for whatever reason no one's paying attention to. But instead, he's like a like a little little nerdy Jewy character that for whatever reason people like, you know, or or women are attracted to. Um I just I I've never seen this movie before. I've seen the the poster a whole lot, and it's one of the Scorsese movies that I have not seen. And there's something about like the the I go back to the capsule of like when this movie was made. I I was not born yet, or maybe I was maybe I was like one or two years old. Uh, yeah, it was eighty-five. But, um, okay, so I was yeah I was three years old. Uh, but uh. I don't know. It's just like a, it feels like a completely different experience, completely different reality that what we live now, and especially in a movie that's supposed to happen all in one night, and then like not enough happens for you to think, okay, how did they come up with a ninety-minute movie? Wait, hold on, pause. Did you just say this was put out in eighty-five? You said you were three years old. Wait, no, in eighty-five I wasn't. I was three. I was gonna say, hold on, Hans. Three. Are you actually in your forties no. right now? You've been lying about your no. age. <laughs> no, I was minus three, so I guess three years before I was born. Is yeah. Okay. All right. That sounds more yeah. correct. Yeah. Wait. No. One year. Eighty-six. Do you? How do you not know Two your years. own birthday, Hans? <laughs> what do you? What do you? Tell me your cell phone number right on now. On the on the podcast. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which cell that. phone number is how uh, I should have answered yeah, that? Yeah. Which which Google email do you use? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, but uh, it's uh, yeah. I I just I really enjoyed myself. I thought it was really funny. I thought that uh, I like the fact that you're not relying on like conventionally uh, conventionally good looking people. It's it's like kind of. I mean, you have Rosanna Arquette, who at the time. I mean, I wasn't even born yet, but I feel like she was one of the one of the actresses that kind of uh, shaped my notice women thing in the early 90s where it was like oh rosanna rosanna arcade is in this all right let's see if she shows that she never showed anything mm -hmm. but it was one of those who were just kind of like okay rosanna i see what you're doing and she kind of does that in this movie before she kills herself but uh but yeah uh i feel like after hours is another movie that i, I don't think you could make now not because no one will be interested in a movie like this but just because they're not willing to risk a movie that might be 20 30 million uh when it's a story about you know one See, night that doesn't go great 
I disagree with you. I think they've tried to make this movie several times and they can't capture that energy and character. Because After Hours is having a second wind where it's like the hip Scorsese pick among film Twitter people and letterbox people. That doesn't make it a bad movie. I don't think that's a bad selection at all. After Hours is great. It's a terrific movie. But that's kind of where it's culturally placed right now. And so you have, the I think, a lot of these movies from young directors that are trying to do that and integrate it into like modern day, but you can't, you can't do no. that. That sort of, uh Oh, you know, the subway only runs until one in the morning. I got to get out of here or else I'm stuck in the city. All that sort of thing doesn't really exist, you know? And I, I don't know. I, I, to have the, uh, it's also a weird movie for Scorsese to have made his mid eighties yeah. run is very peculiar for him. And I think underrated between that and color of money, Color of Money, especially, I think is excellent. And nobody mm. really talks about that film. Tom Cruise is great in it. Paul Newman's great in it. But that's another touchstone picture. So did, I'm not going to talk about We did a drunk on movies of Color of Money. Ah, okay. So go check that out then. Well, I, 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 think, I think the show's been pulled indefinitely for, oh, no. for reasons I, I'll relay off the air. Okay, yes. Uh, rest in peace, drunk on movies. Again. Again. Yes. Again. <laughs> uh, was that it for After Hours, though, Hans? Yeah, I think I said what I was Okay. Say, yeah. All right, Wolfman, we're going to pass the ball over to you. All right. Uh, no, so speaking of After Hours, it came out in 1985. Moose, cut it out. Sorry, my cat is scratching my DVDs. On my oh, my DVD God. Device. I thought that was a dog jumping around yeah. your apartment. That's a very no, loud cat. No, no, it's just, yeah, I have the loudest cat on planet Earth. Uh, but 1985 was a tough year uh, to narrow it down. You had After Hours, you had Lady Hawk, you had The Goonies, a lot of, like, big popular and cult movies that year. But I had to go with Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Um, yeah, I think one that's, of the poles. I think that's Tim Burton's first theatrical. I don't know. I think he did. Did he do with Frank and Weenie? Was that technically first? That w that was not a feature though. That okay. was only twenty minutes. I do have a videotape of that somewhere. Yeah. The superior Frank and Weenie. I might add. Uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. It's one of those movies where I saw it a bunch as a kid. Kind of grew up with it and just enjoyed it. You know, from a, a child's perspective because it's so odd. And then I revisited it when I was older and was like, oh, this is actually a good movie. This isn't just something I liked because I was a kid. Um, there's just nothing like it. And even in the rest of Tim Burton's career, uh, he never even approaches anything like this. I mean, they're, they're, you know, their commonalities, you know, he still does the Danny Elfman score and you know, all that stuff. But like for, for a filmmaker's first feature, I think this is arguably one of the best, especially for like the second half of the 20th century. Uh, it's like a David Lynch movie for kids. It's just so bizarre. And unlike anything else, you have this Pee Wee Herman character. You're given no backstory. You're given no explanation as to why he is the way he is. Just this kind of like uh, living ventriloquist dummy almost that lives in his own little weird world in his house with a Rube Goldberg machine that makes him breakfast every morning. He has this bike that he loves and the, the everyone in the world around Pee Wee just accepts him as he is. They're not like, Oh, there goes the town kook Pee Wee Herman. Nothing is explained. You are just forced to accept the reality of the movie, which is here's Pee Wee go with it. Uh, not only, yeah. Not only could you not make this movie now, no one would think of it now. It's it's it is that singular and that bizarre, and it has the most unique sense of humor. Uh, yeah, it's just this odd road movie. Um, and if you haven't seen it, you've got to watch it. I mean, I feel like anyone listening has seen it, but if not, if somehow you missed it, uh. It, yeah, it is just it's just one of a kind for what you were saying with this feature being Tim Burton's debut. It's a very confident, established, stylistic feature for someone to premiere their career with. 
It's ve- it's a very explosive introduction for Tim Burton. No, it never just, yeah, it. he just I've, oh god, never, Hans. I started today, but I didn't really have like my whole attention to give it. So I I I think I saw like five minutes while I was working, and I was like, well, I feel like this is one of those movies where you actually have to pay full attention on because it's such a different world that they're introducing to you that you kind of have to get all the little, I guess, little things that the world has to offer. And if you're not really paying attention to what Tim Burton does or what, what's his name uh, does as a, as Pee Wee, then it's better to not see it. So I haven't, um, I did see Edward Scissorhands very recently, and that has a lot of Tim Burton's style that you don't see in his modern movies anymore. So even though that was 90s, and I don't want to compare that to Pee Wee's uh, adventure, I'm sure that I'm a big fan of his like early run of, I want to say, I would tour movies before the studios started before fucking Disney with got his a hold shit. of them. Yeah, before studios started fucking with his shit and took away from his cr- creativity, and it was more about, you know, what it will make the studio money. I'm assuming that this is something like that for like the 10, 15 minutes that I watched, but I also didn't want to be unfair and not give it my full attention because I, yeah, I noticed that it, it's like an alternative, alternative world. It's not like, a, it's like an alternative reality, kind of like what Edward Scissorhands is. So I was like, yeah, it, it wouldn't be fair for me to just kind of passively watch it and not pay attention to what they're trying to do. So I haven't seen it. And Pee Wee is not a character that has ever been relevant in my life. So maybe that's that might be the main reason why. Uh, well, but, some people uh, would say you should just skip it and watch Big Top Pee Wee instead. I no one would say that. Okay. No one would say that. The person who says that is the person who says that season two of True Detective is better than season one. That person yeah, is well. a clown. There are no Big Top Pee Wee <laughs> stands on, on any platform that I've ever seen. People really just block that movie out of existence. I liked it as a kid. I like some parts of it. I like, you know, I liked when uh, I think there's like a tornado that comes to town and he's hiding in a greenhouse. I I like all that. And then when it actually comes to the circus, then I get bored. Yeah. So, and it's been a long time. It's been like 30 years since I've watched Big Top Pee Wee. So I bet it's better than whatever that Netflix one that they put out five or six years ago was. Oh, yeah. I never I never even bothered with that. I knew that was going to be dog shit. I think it was about Pee Wee falling in love with Joe Manganiello. Mm. Probably, oh, yeah, that, sure. yeah, makes sense. Uh, that 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 definitely fits the Netflix model. Mm-hmm. But um, also, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Just on a personal note, it's one of those movies where, uh, <clears throat> when you're growing up, you ever have a movie that you just kind of like, with like either with a person or a group of people, that's just like your movie, and it always comes up. It's always referenced. Like me, my older brother, and our cousin Adam, for whatever reason, this movie just became it was that movie for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were constantly refer- referencing it, we were constantly riffing on it. Uh, if we were bored, you know, we were kids, there was only so much we could do. Um, if we couldn't figure out anything to do, we would always just throw it on. Um, yeah, and it uh, it's one of those movies that it, it's it's funnier to me as an adult than it was as a kid. It's more impressive to me as an adult. And yeah, maybe I'm overselling it, but, and I'm not even the world's biggest Tim Burton fan, but it is just so singular. There's really nothing else like it. Yeah. I second that. I, I, the Brattle, and I'll, I'll say the theme of this show came from the Brattle theaters calendar from late November to early January, 2024 where they were on theme with doing Warner Brothers films in the 1980s every single day during that stretch of time. I was very close to going to see Pee Wee's Big Adventure in 35 millimeter at the Brattle Theater on New Year's Eve and ultimately decided, yeah, I don't don't think we have time for that. So uh, Mm -hmm. I kind of wish I had gotten to check that out in that format. I think it could have been really interesting and engaging. But my next film is going to be kind of an offbeat pick, and a lot of people don't even know that Warner Brothers put this movie out. It is Paul Schrader's Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters, also from 1985, which is by far the biggest visual spectacle film of Paul Schrader's career. I've been watching 
I don't know if either of you guys have seen this. Hans, maybe your grandpa has watched this movie. Our Hitler, a life, uh, not a life in four chapters, a film from Germany. Um, Francis Ford Coppola. He didn't, he's not been watching that, but he was probably. (laughs) They reference him a couple of times, I think. So um, I've been watching this movie. It is a seven hour, four part film from Germany, of course. And Francis Ford Coppola put it out in 1980. It was released in 1977, but it was uh, released in theaters in the United States in 1980. Francis Ford Coppola also put out Mishima. I have to assume Paul Schrader watched this movie before doing Mishima because it's like he borrowed a lot of the aesthetics and style of that, which is very stagey, and then implemented it into something a bit more cohesively narrative. And the performances in Mishima are terrific. Uh, and I think either version of the film you watch, whether it has the Roy Scheider as Mishima voiceover, or you go with the traditional Japanese voiceover, are uh, you know splendid viewings for this movie. Uh, Wolfman, have you seen Mishima? I haven't seen Mishima. Uh, I've been meaning to. I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, I, yeah, I've only heard good things. Uh, I've read a little Mishima. I've just read some of his short stories. Uh, I want to read a little more because I don't I don't feel like his short stories uh, kind of captured uh, what's appealing about him or if they did maybe I just didn't get it maybe I don't have the brain for it or maybe something was lost in translation Mishima a life in four chapters takes from his stories and illustrates essentially a biography of the man using his own fiction but it also uses as a wraparound segment his uh, attempt to uh, overthrow the uh the government of japan during that time the coup that he holds in trying to restore power to the emperor which clearly fails and then he winds up uh killing himself as a result of that for for a dignified failure there mm. so it's it's a very great film we've talked about it before on this program probably i think two different episodes maybe because we did a paul schrader retrospective where we were discussing his films. And then I think it might have come up again during a best watched in X year special that we did. But Mishima, I think, is a a terrific film, an absolute masterpiece. Paul Schrader's best movie, without question, and one of the best films during this era of filmmaking. Anyway, Hans, over yeah. to your final selection, and then we will continue on the next episode of Movies. So my pick was a movie that, for whatever reason, I have been put off watching. Uh, and I think it was because, I don't know if you remember when the, the Warriors game for the PlayStation 1 or 2 came out uh, with Rockstar Games. It was like a big hit. And there was like a, a big renaissance of the Warriors in like 2000, I want to say 2006, 2005. Yeah, I remember that. There was, a lot of, where there was a lot of like, oh, fuck, the Warriors in this movie, great or whatever. And then I remember that where I was living, which I believe was in Canada, they had a double feature of the Warriors and the Outsiders. Uh, I never saw the Outsiders, but I saw that those two movies, for whatever reason, are always very uh, compared to each other. And I saw the Outsiders today, and I don't, I don't think there's any. I would say Greece is closer to the Outsiders than the Warriors. It's, it's just a very weird comparison that I until now have realized how they're not like each other at all. Like the worst is one of my favorite movies of all time. I think it's, it's a really fun uh, movie. Uh, it's like a, I guess, I guess kind of like, like a road trip movie without a car. Um, and then the outsider, it has such a great cast and a lot of really great performances, but as much as I enjoyed what they did with this story, I kept comparing it to what they do in The Warriors, which I believe came out in the 70s, right? And uh, this is just a lot tamer. Like, I, I, re- I really did like how um, the entire cast is just young actors that will become someone. I don't, I don't believe there's anyone here that doesn't, you know, become a huge star. But... Um, well, see Thomas Howell, he was pretty contained oh, after doing Soul Man. I, yeah, he became the Soul Man, though. Oh, yeah. right. I forgot about that. Yeah. I was like, well, I wonder why his career didn't pan out as well. 
I guess that's a perfect example as to why. But but, but uh, he was you know he was in the Hitcher. Uh, he was a supporting role yeah. in ET. So I mean he he had a he had a little bit of time. Maybe not late nineties two thousands as much as the, the Hitcher other... too. He didn't he didn't <laughs> yeah. he didn't take off like all the other guys. Uh, yeah, he didn't Tom Cruise it up. He didn't uh, Patrick Swayze his yeah. way into yeah 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 any whoever whoever compared the warriors to the outsiders yeah that's ridiculous um yeah they're nothing well alike. that's i know that's what and that kind of put me off from watching the movie until today just because i was like well i love the warriors uh it has a lot of really like non-actors given okay performances like the performances are obviously not as good as in this one uh, on and the outsiders but i there was also something about uh, well, two things. Raul Macchio, I think Ralph Macchio. How do you say he's fucking Italian? Wow, did you just call uh, Ralph Macchio, Ralph. Rob Macchio? Yeah. Damn. Caramel yeah. Macchiato. <laughs> Hans, you're muted. Your mic is fucked, my, uh, Hans. There it is. There I I go. feel like his career is uh, definitely one that. If you see his early movies, you would expect it to be a lot better than it actually was. Maybe that whole thing about looking like a kid in your 20s or 30s doesn't really work out for most people unless your name is fucking Elijah Wood, who seems to have been able to pull it off. Well, he's coming back. He's uh, got the new Karate Kid movie with Jackie Chan where they're merging the that's universes. So sad. That's, so that's all he's sad, got. Though, because like, that's all he's got. I know, but but like there's so many early or or not 80s movies where he's like a kid and he's a good actor and how difficult is it to get a good actor that's a fucking kid? They're usually fucking stink. And he's really good in this. And then I started thinking about the rest of the cast and I was like, "Oh fuck, I guess I mean, C. Thomas Howell is one I wasn't thinking of, but uh, Ralph Macchio is one that he had some huge movies in the 80s and just kind of disappeared. And then he had what, I guess, Cobra Kai, where his career was kind of rejuvenated. Uh, yeah, yeah, but he was in uh, he was in My Cousin Vinny, um, mm. but he had that. Yeah, he had that problem of. Yeah, always kind of looking very boyish. Like a kid. Yeah. yeah. And like as he grew up and became, you know, a grown man. He didn't work out and try to become like just a a hunky guy. Like he, yeah, he, trying you know, to be very like dice clay ish, and he's just like you're not yeah, that and Italian. He was, and even like, that <laughs> that may not have worked just because it, as good of an actor as he was, like he he was not dangerous. So maybe trying yeah. to be just like a good looking guy who's who good looking leading man who just keeps looking young, maybe that might not have worked out for him. But he, yeah, like. He got to a point to where it was like, if we want what you're offering, we can get it better from Fred Savage, you know, or for from or Tom Hanks, even, you know, some somebody like this kind of like, yeah, bo boyish kind of young everyman deal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it didn't work out for him. But I will say, while The Outsiders is like, it's decent, you know, it's based on a, a novel that's just kind of like, it's not YA, but it's definitely a novel for like, uh adolescence um even better than the movie itself is uh i think emilio estevez's performance as two-bit matthews uh he steals the whole fucking movie for yeah. me um and i constantly reference him uh, that's one that's one of my favorite performances i was gonna ask hans did you watch the outsiders or the outsiders the complete novel i um it was two hours i'm not sure because Francis Ford Coppola has a bigger habit than George Lucas of going back and re-editing and re-releasing. And there's a version of The Outsiders that I guess is his definitive director's cut called The Outsiders, the complete novel. And I think that was put okay. out in the early aughts on DVD. Well, there was a theatrical cut. That's not the one that I watched. I think that was 90 so you, minutes. All right. You, I, it sounds I like you watched them, the longer the one. Longer. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I didn't dislike it. I thought... I thought uh, in a very stand by me ish type of movie, um, it worked for me, and I, I, I think my bias with like the whole Warriors thing that now feels very stupid because like this is two movies that have nothing to do with each other other than, hey, uh, ga gangs. If you can even call that on the Outsider, it's just it's very Leave It to Beaver uh, danger. 
other than the stabbing, which you don't really see. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but I think, it, yeah, it, it shows how um, a lot of these young actors, like it makes sense that they ended up making like bigger careers because even, even someone like Tom Cruise that has a small, very small role here. Uh, he's very good at, at whatever goofy toothed character he's playing here. Uh, and, and yeah, Emilio Estevez, who ends up being uh, um, um, Mighty Duck guy for the rest of his life, <laughs> even if he doesn't want, he's like Bombay forever. Uh, he, he does like a very good, like poor boy, greasy hair uh, performance here. So I, I thought um, once again, and I, I keep going back to this, like I keep going back to these are not big movies like this is not like a very complicated convoluted story where uh you're gonna be sitting there trying to figure out how how can they surprise me with something new that i've never seen before they're they're all like very small stories about well shit something happened between this group of people and this other group of kids i guess and now let's just build a, a whole movie around it but it works and i just kind of wish that studios were willing to take um risks on smaller stories like this where like i mean sure there's someone that gets killed uh <laughs> which is which is i guess you know something big or whatever but but it, it's more of a, a character story of like how someone that's like a poor dirty kid would deal with it and, and like how everyone around them would deal with with a with an accident like that and i just kind of wish that we still had interesting shit released released by big studios like this instead of having to dive into a a, a sea of shitty independent movies where you might be able to find one or two that are worth watching after you know 20 others that just kind of suck well maybe the goonies too when that comes out (laughs) Uh, just before fucking Corey. Feldman dies. Oh, he ain't dying. He would have died a long time ago if he was going to die. <laughs> All right. He drinks I... formaldehyde every night. <laughs> to look like that. All right. I think we're going to pause there for now because this is looking like a multi-part special to be unpacking so much of Warner Brothers during the 1980s. Wolfman, thank you for joining us for this first installment. Um, it, what would you like to plug? Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, just uh, yeah. thanks again for having me on. So my plugs, if you don't already, follow me on Twitter at D-E-T underscore Wolfman. Uh, Check out my rock and roll radio show on the beat on SoundCloud. It is a SoundCloud exclusive. And I just dropped the pilot for my new podcast, Bloody Pulp. First episode is me and Max Thrax talking about Get Carter. Check that out on Spotify. And I'm going to see if I can upload it to a few more uh, services. But yeah, that's what I got. Superb. And probably by the time this episode hits Spotify and Apple Podcasts, uh, my episode with you will be dropping because it'll be about it'll be a couple of weeks before this is public. OK, then, yeah, they might drop at the same time. Yeah, I've got I got low res coming up on the next one. Uh, I've got uh, I got an episode with Blauergeist, uh, George of um, uh, shit, um, George's movie journal. Um, I've got uh, Stephen Powell, the James Elroy biographer. Nice. Uh, and uh, much, much more. I've got a lot of good guests coming up. Excellent. All right. Well, for now, that has been movies for this week. Go subscribe to the $5 tier on patreon.com slash low res if you want to watch four minutes of Hans stumbling to find the right Donald Duck saying the N-word clip uh, along with us. I think that is a classic treasure. Also, Hans, this was this was the voice of Donald Duck. Okay. So, Yeah. So he, you think he said it? He definitely said it. All right, that's been movies for this week. Thank you for listening.